In the fourth gospel called John, Jesus insists that Israelites eat his flesh and blood so that they might have a kind of life befitting children of God. What does this mean? Is Jesus really teaching about Catholics receiving Holy Communion? Is he talking about the real presence in the Eucharist? Catholics often think that he is. But what was the anonymous author we call John really trying to communicate? To informed Bible readers, it's obvious that the author of John employs anti-language when his Jesus insists about ingesting his flesh and blood. Unlike the other New Testament groups, the Johannine community became an anti-society, a conscious alternative group to the dominant society, in this case, first century Israel. An anti-society is an alternate society rooted in a form of social conflict carried on by dissociated persons living in a hollowed out social sphere within the dominant social order. Anti-societies have their own anti-language. Anti-language is the language of an anti-society. Anti-societies develop anti-language precisely to prevent outsiders from understanding them. It may use the same vocabulary and grammar that the dominant society's language has, but all of it gets employed in an unorthodox way in which usual words get filled up with unusual new meanings, central to the concerns of the anti-society. One of the features of anti-language is heavy over-lexicalization. That means too many words and expressions used for the same reality of concern for the anti-society. Boy, do you see that in the Gospel called John. John has too many words that mean the same thing. Too many different expressions all meaning the same thing. In fact, reading John is like mowing a lawn with nothing but endless crabgrass. The Johannine style is so repetitive, it just goes around and around and around in circles. The author is saying the same thing over and over again, using the same words, or different words that mean the same thing. It's important to realize that John was not written to communicate ideas. Instead, the basic purpose of Johannine anti-language is not to communicate ideas, but to imbue interpersonal relationships with ever-deepening emotional anchoring. Put another way, John was not written to give ideas about God and Jesus. Instead, John was written to ensure that every member of the Johannine Jesus group stuck together like glue forever. To that end, the author of John says the same thing in many different anti-language expressions over and over and over again. With the exception of Appended Chapter 21, not the original ending to John, in fact, a holy sh** text, as in, holy shit, we're going extinct, we better get with those Petrine Jesus groups. And the interpolated story of the woman caught in adultery, a story completely foreign to John in so many ways, it breaks the flow of John, it's completely different than the anti-language of John. Nothing following the first 18 verses in John chapter 1 offers any new information or ideas. In fact, every idea that the author wants to communicate is given in those first 18 verses. Everything that follows those first 18 verses is rehash and saying the same thing in different ways over and over again, like mowing crabgrass. And that includes John chapter 6, folks. So please, when you read John chapter 6, don't expect any grand theological discourse on the real presence in the Eucharist there. It's just more crabgrass. It's just more of the same anti-language. But please, don't tell that to my fellow Catholics. They think John chapter 6 is this magnificent theological treatise about the Eucharist. 
They think it's about Jesus establishing a religious institution chemically isolated from and in competition with Israelite religion, which they relentlessly and erroneously confuse with later Talmudic Judaism. And many Catholics wrongly believe that this bread of life discourse is talking about what happens when some ontologically changed super creatures or sacramental vending machines say what amounts to a magical incantation that produces ontological changes allowing us to worship bread and wine. But that really isn't what John is talking about. If it was, those would be new ideas. Again, John isn't giving us any new ideas in John chapter 6 because John doesn't communicate new ideas after John chapter 1 verse 18. One glaring problem here is that many Catholics conflate John chapter 6 with what's happening in the Last Supper featured in the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus refers to the bread as his body and the wine as his blood. But John doesn't have an institution narrative. John was not written to be conflated with or fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle piece with the synoptics Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And the context in John is entirely different from that of the synoptic Last Supper at which Jesus offers bread and wine as his body and blood. Unlike the synoptic Gospels and Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, there is no prophetic, symbolic action with bread and wine in John. Instead, you get a foot washing. All you get in the Gospel called John is straightforward anti-language. Sorry! My friends, this confuses Catholics who enjoy reading John chapter 6 to justify their obsessions with Eucharistic devotions and to prove that their Christianity is superior to all others, meanwhile completely ignoring that Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, and other Christian groups share the Eucharist. But John wasn't written by Catholics, for Catholics, or about Catholics. Rather, the document was written for, by, and about an ancient Jesus group anti-society of Israelite misfits. And the anti-language it was written in made good sense to them, if not to us. Okay, so let's break down the expression found in John chapter 6, flesh and blood. To understand what the Johannine Jesus means in this anti-language use of flesh and blood, you have to first grasp two different social contexts taken from the dominant society of first century Israel. In other words, before you can get the Johannine understanding, the anti-language understanding of flesh and blood, you have to first get how outsiders to the Johannine Jesus group that were Israelite would understand flesh and blood. First, flesh and blood meant human creatures. It means created bodily and mortal. Flesh and blood means perishable. This understanding is what Paul had in mind when he wrote, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. By the way, Paul was an Israelite who, unlike John, did not write in anti-language. If Paul had ever gotten the chance to pick up the anti-language gospel called John and read it, he would think he was reading in Greek. Ultimately, Paul wouldn't understand John. So in one sense, flesh and blood to ancient Israelites meant human creature. Whether friendly or hostile, humans are flesh and blood, and like Adam, are made from mud and return to mud at death. Human creatures, flesh and blood equaling mud, are unlike the lofty sky vault beings, made of flame and wind. These spirits are the principalities, powers, world rulers, and other wicked spirit warriors ancient Mediterranean biblical peoples imagined. But also among these fiery wind beings are the sky servants of God's fancy entourage above. And the most honorable of these, according to ancient Israelite sky lore, was the Son of Man, or Lamb of God, a constellation we today call Ares, the Ram. Certainly the life of this celestial sky vault man is not that of flesh and blood that equals mud, 
So flesh and blood means mortal human creatures. And this is the first ordinary first century Israelite meaning. The second meaning is relative to animals. In this sense, the flesh and blood phrase is used to distinguish what is edible by humans. For Israelites, the only edible meat derives exclusively from that offered in temple sacrifice. But even of those edible animals, two parts belong to God and could not be ingested by Israelites. The blood and the fat surrounding the kidneys. As far as blood goes, in fact, according to ancient Israelite tradition, no human beings, not even Gentiles, were permitted to ingest blood. That rule went double for Israelites. But also Israelites were forbidden from eating the other source of life. Specifically, this was the fat surrounding the kidneys of a sacrificed animal. Ancients associated this kidney fat as the seed of life because of the way it connected with the sexual organs. The idea was that the sexual organs gave life, just like blood gave life. Life comes from the blood, life comes from the sexual organs, life comes ultimately from God. Life belongs to God exclusively. Hence the prohibitions against ingesting blood and kidney fat. So when the Johannine Jesus refers to his flesh and blood, his listeners would have both these meanings on their minds. One, mortal human creatures and two, the blood and kidney fat of a sacrificed animal. In other words, they didn't understand because they didn't get the anti-language. Anyone reading John who was not part of the Johannine anti-society wouldn't get the anti-language either and would necessarily misunderstand the Johannine Jesus. They will believe they are reading common Israelite understandings in ordinary Greek. Therefore, they would imagine that Jesus was telling them to consume prohibited foods God forbade since the days of Noah. Worse, they would understand that Jesus is insisting on cannibalism. But again, remember, this is anti-language. And John chapter 6 is just like every other part of John. It's just another way of saying the same thing repeatedly in different ways. For Johannine insiders, it's comedy. It's an ironic laugh riot. For outsiders, it's a horror show. In the 21st century, Catholics think it's talking about the Eucharist and their doctrines and devotions. Israelite outsiders to the Johannine group think Jesus is insisting that Israelites should break God's food laws and engage in cannibalism. But insiders to the Johannine community, people who the text was written for, realize that ingesting Jesus' flesh and blood is synonymous with welcoming Jesus, accepting Jesus, receiving Jesus, believing into Jesus, abiding with Jesus, following Jesus, loving Jesus, keeping the words of Jesus, and so forth. It all means the same thing, to forever emotionally anchor into the Johannine anti-society. My friends, John is pretty ironic here and very funny. The sacrificial context of kidney fat, flesh and blood doesn't mean cannibalism. And it wasn't really talking about the Eucharist in its literal sense. It simply meant emotionally anchoring into the Johannine Jesus group, despite Jesus having been humiliatingly lifted up and glorified on the cross of shame. So everything John is saying in John chapter six is just a retelling and rehash of the exact same thing readers were informed of back in John chapter one, verses 12 and 13. To all who received him, who believed into his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of the mixing of bloods, that is, sexual reproduction as understood by ancients, or of the will of the flesh, that is, sexual desire, or of the will of a man, a male desiring an heir, who willfully decides to procreate, but of God. In the ancient understanding, blood was the seed of life. The sexual organs where surrounded by the fat that surrounds the kidneys was the seed of life. The will of the flesh, sexual desire, is in that fat surrounding the kidneys. 
while the will of man is in the intellect, which is found in the heart, according to ancients, not the brain. It is through ingesting Jesus' flesh and blood, through accepting and welcoming Jesus as the word become Israelite human, crucified as king of the Judeans, that those who believe into Jesus have their life as children of God. This is what the Johannine insiders would understand by eat Jesus' flesh and blood. Children of God in Greek is techne feiou, the name that the Johannine anti-society gave their own group. By the late first century, the Johannine anti-society didn't give a damn about the Israelite theocracy or kingdom of God expected by Jesus and his followers 60 years earlier. These people enjoyed Jesus' presence in endless descents of the Sky Vault Man in their gatherings. Who cares about some forthcoming kingdom when it was already there, available to all who stuck like glue to this Jesus group and enjoyed its trance experiences? Whether they had physical bread, wine, cups, a banquet hall, in ordinary reality or not, didn't matter either. All that they needed was provided by the descended Sky Vault Man in alternate reality.